Well, it's a new week. And once again, I'm as bald as a cue ball. Thank you very much, TNA. At least this time, I'm not alone. So they got you too, huh? Yeah. Fortunately, unlike you, I can pull this look off. I've been mistaken for Nigel McGuinness three times today. Well, la-dee-da. Aren't you special? Hey. Get that sarcastic tone out of your voice. Or I might just have to break out the finger poke of doom again. Go ahead. I already lost my hair. What else could you possibly take away from me? Ah! All right, all right, no more sarcasm! I hope not. For your sake. Can I have my clothes back now? Please? Only because I allow it. All right, real quick. Before I talk about the show, I just want to send some well wishes out to Matt Hardy. I'm not his biggest fan, and I never will be. In fact, I've had some less than flattering things to say about him recently, but I'm not a heartless bastard. And I was very glad to hear that Matt decided to go to rehab and straighten himself out, because I didn't want to see Matt become a wrestling tragedy, and it seemed like he was heading down that road for a while. So it's great to know that Matt is going to get the help he needs. So let's hope that happens. Anyway, Impact. I liked this show for the most part, even though there were only four matches. You know, Jesse Sorensen got his X Division title shot against Austin Aries. The match was pretty decent for a few minutes, but then the obligatory overbooking started. Kid Cash came out and distracted Sorensen with that football that he comes out with for some reason, and then Aries gets the win with a cheap roll up. This started out good, but it ended up exemplifying so many of the things I hate about Russo's booking. A championship title match where the focus is on everything except the fact that the title is on the line. Why did Cash have to be involved that much when they could have kept his part to a minimum and gotten the same effect? Why did Ares have to use a roll-up? Why couldn't he just get the win with a brain buster? Why can't the X Division champion just beat a rookie clean? What the hell is wrong with that? You people are fools! They did Ken Anderson versus Bully Ray and Jerry Lynn. This became a handicap match when someone took out RVD backstage. There was no reason on earth why this couldn't end clean. The heels don't need to cheat. They already have an unfair advantage. They can just win because there's two of them and there's one of him, and Anderson doesn't lose anything by jobbing clean. But instead, Bully Ray hits him with a chain for no other reason than he's a heel and heels cheat because they're evil. Never mind the fact that it made the heels look like crap because they needed to cheat to beat a guy two-on-one. This whole show is ridiculous! I am so sick of these contrived, overbooked bullshit finishes. So many matches are ruined by these damn things. Why can't a match just end clean, for God's sake? Crimson's matches have clean finishes. Most of the matches in the Bound for Glory series had clean finishes. I hope that was going to be the start of a change in this stupid booking. I guess that was asking for too much. Mickey James beat Tessmacher clean, and Tessmacher didn't lose anything. In fact, I'd say both women ended up looking better because this match had a clean finish. The match is back and forth, both women get their offense in, Mickey wins clean, but does Tessmacher look worse for having lost the match? No! It's Mickey James! One of the most decorated women in wrestling! She should be hard to beat! Just like Austin Aries should be hard to beat because he's Austin freaking Aries. Just like Bully Ray and Jerry Lynn should be hard to beat because there's two of them versus one guy. There's no reason why these people shouldn't be able to win clean. Winning matches clean is a good thing, goddammit! Aside from that, I enjoyed pretty much everything else. Mickey vs. Tessmacher was pretty short, but it was fairly decent for the most part. And I hate to say it, but Tessmacher is starting to grow on me. I stand by what I said before, I still think they put her in the ring too soon. And yeah, she still has some work to do, but she's improved significantly. And she's continuing to improve. And this is why I now rank Tessmacher above women like Velvet Sky, who has not improved at all since she debuted four years ago, and Madison Rain, who has actually gotten worse. So good for Tessmacher for changing my mind about her. You know, the crowds are digging her, she's got mic skills, and if she continues to improve in the ring, I think TNA could have something with this lady. 
I'm not saying I'd put the title on her tomorrow, but she could turn into a solid investment. There was a pre-tape where Mexican America went to get Anarchia a new tattoo. I have no idea why the cameras would follow any wrestlers on the roster, much less these two ass clowns to a tattoo parlor, but whatever. This started out pretty dumb, but then Ink Inc. made their return and beat the shit out of them. And I won't lie, I enjoyed that. The tag team division is in bad shape right now, so having Ink Inc. back is a good thing. At least that gives them a little diversity. Also, something interesting happened here. Did you see that girl who elbowed Anarchia in the face when he tried to use her as a human shield? Unless I'm very much mistaken, that was Christina Von Erie. New female talent? One that's actually relevant? And interesting? I don't know why they waited so long to debut her. I guess Jesse Neal's injury must have held that up. But this was cool. I knew she was going to show up on Impact in a couple of weeks anyway, but I didn't expect to see her there. Now, I assume she's going to be the equalizer to take care of Sarita and Rosita, so some challengers can actually get a tag title shot free of interference for a change. And if that's where they're going with this, then thank God. Let's do it. AJ and Daniels had a promo where Daniels finally turned heel officially. I have no idea how Daniels got out of facing Bobby Roode in a match. I mean, he basically just said, no, I don't want to. And that was it. Nobody questioned this. Immortal didn't care. They didn't force him to go through with the match. Why? I don't know. Never explained. This whole show violates everything about my journalistic integrity. Once you get past that, though, the stuff with him and AJ was really good. My feelings about this feud are still the same. I still think it's become redundant and it's preventing Daniel's character from evolving. But I actually liked how this played out because, for once, the writers actually paid attention to the details. Daniels has always had an inferiority complex. I mean, AJ said that every time he gets a little power and starts to think that he's a somebody, it goes to his head and the heelish side of him comes out. And... that makes sense. That's just the way his character has developed over the years. It's totally organic that he would risk destroying his friendship with AJ to finally get that monkey off his back. So unlike the Kurt Angle swerve, this is a heel turn that makes sense because, put in this situation, that's just something that everyone knows Daniels would do. In other words, this heel turn was earned for the same reasons that the Kurt Angle heel turn was not. The best part of this show was the stuff with Kurt Angle, Bobby Roode, and James Storm. The promo segment was solid. They're doing a great job with Bobby Roode, making him look like he's on the same level as Kurt Angle. The only issue was that James Storm totally outshined him on the mic here. And I am happy that Bobby Roode is getting this push, but damn it, James Storm deserves it just as much. Storm has more charisma than just about anyone in the company, and his mic skills are extremely underrated. Now, you can argue that Roode is better in the ring and has a better look, and that might be true, but Storm has all the tools. And I'm thrilled that he's not falling by the wayside while Roode gets pushed to the top, because there is no reason why Storm can't be a breakout single star, too. And not only was his promo great, but he had a great match with Kurt Angle in the main event, and they actually gave it some time for once. This was one of the best main events on Impact this year, and the interference didn't even bug me that much because they actually let this go for like 10 plus minutes before Gunner showed up. And while I didn't like the non-finish, I thought Angle needed to look stronger than that. I love the stare down at the end with Bobby Roode holding up the world title. You really do get the sense that TNA is finally serious about pushing a homegrown guy to the top, and that is very, very refreshing. So for the most part, this episode was pretty good. The overbooking and Russo finishes piss me the hell off, but there does seem to be a sense of, we need to get serious about hype and bound for glory. And that was prevalent this week. Your Kurt Angle, Bobby Roode is starting to feel like a big match. They've toned down the stupid stuff, at least temporarily, and I don't want to jinx it, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we may get through Bound for Glory without the obligatory Eric Young match that usually gets thrown in on big shows like this just for the sake of giving him a pay-per-view spot that by all rights should be going to someone else. Sure, it wasn't perfect, but hell, even PW Torch liked the show this week. And if those guys have something good to say about this company, it might just be worth checking out. So this was a good episode. It's just a shame that they don't put this kind of effort into hyping their pay-per-views every month.